All right, well, good morning, and thank you for attending this presentation on EFT processing, or processing for our American friends. Um, with the EFT processing solution, as you can see, it's embedded directly into the Sage 300 desktop, and that's because it's written in what we call the SDK, or the Software Development Kit for Sage 300. Now, the real key to understanding how EFT processing works is that we're replacing the creation of paper-based checks and instead generating an EFT file that we then upload to the bank's website. And we can handle AP payments, we can handle AR receipts, as well as AR refunds in the base EFT package, and we can also handle payroll direct deposit if you add in the EFT for payroll. Okay. Now, some of the benefits include also uh, in, in including sending electronic payments, but also emailing remittance advices. So you can set up your own email templates, whether that be for direct debits, pulling money from a customer account, or making payments to a vendor. And we have variables where you can add in the vendor's name, the invoice date, the amount, and a contact name at the vendor. So we very much wanna create a paperless environment where we're creating payments and notification electronically. Now, of course, that raises issues of security and privacy. So as part of the package, we've created some audit logs as well that will allow you to log every time you create an EFT file with a date and a timestamp, as well as the nature of the transactions, whether they're AP payments, AR receipts. And we can also identify the user within Sage 300 who's created that EFT batch, the bank against which they're making payments or receiving money, the file folder, which could include just a network file share, or it could be Google Docs or Microsoft OneDrive, any type of repository, Dropbox is another example, where we can store the files prior to transmission to the bank, and then the total dollar value of the transactions within that EFT file. We also create a log every time you set up a new customer or vendor in the system. So as you're adding new vendors, as an example, we will record all of the values that have been set up for that EFT vendor profile. And as you make changes, you'll be able to see the old value and the new value that it was changed to. So we keep track of these in the log and you can run an inquiry or there's a separate report to do so. There are a number of different options that you can specify when you set up the system, both for AR customers and AP vendors. But as I mentioned, the primary bank, this is the real key to understanding how EFT works. The primary bank is the bank that you would set up for you as the user of the EFT processing system. And as you'll see, there are a number of different file formats that we create uh, for Canadian banks, as well as international banks, and American banks. And the thing to note here is that even for the same bank, there are a multitude of different formats that are supported because there are different types of transactions that are supported and different services that these banks offer. So it's not just about making check payments, you can do e-transfers. A lot of people today, instead of sending checks, are doing what they call interact email transfers, which is something you can do in Canada between Canadian businesses. But you also have international rules for ACH payments. You have um, the standard check payments. And then you have things like wire payments and other formats that are supported. So specifically, if we're looking at wires, you can see here there's a Canadian TD Bank wire. There's a positive pay for when you send a check, but you still send a file to the bank to ensure that only hey, Rob, the checks that are cleared. Yeah. Um, sorry, are the screens that you're popping up and showing doesn't appear on this uh, screens that we are looking at. Oh, really? Okay. Ah. I wonder why, because I'm doing I think share. You're specifically sharing just that one desktop and the other screens are not covered in. Okay. Let's do that and share. There oh, you go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Now I can see that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So unfortunately, some people will miss those original screens, but 
Uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow along by what I was saying. So here's some of the international formats. And we've been asked to look at specifically some of the American formats. So you can see in the US, it's ACH as opposed to EFT. And there are standard NACHA file formats that include pre-note information, which is something unique to American uh, electronic transactions. Uh, but we also have formats for a number of the large financial institutions within the UK and then also the USA. So you can see here uh, the NACHA formats for smaller financial institutions like Eastern Bank. There's even a FedEx EDI format for the EDI 820 payment. And then other types of formats, in this case, Bank of America, where it's wire, ACH, international wire, or a CSV. Now, as I mentioned, there's a number of different formats. In the case of JP Morgan, you can see here again, we support a standard domestic money transfer, but also a global file for international payments, and then a wire payment. So for JP Morgan, if you're sending international wires, we do have a format available for that. And then again, you can see other formats that are supported based on different information that you want included with the file, as well as the payment or the service offering from JP Morgan. The thing to remember, and the reason how we're able to support all these different types of payment options is because the banks themselves have what they call specification files for the format and layout of the data within the EFT file. So these are specifications that determine the content as well as the spacing of the data within the file. It can also include things like hash totals to ensure that the numbers are properly calculated and recorded and that there's no modification to the file once it's been generated by the system. And you'll find that as you upload these files to the banks through their websites, that they have processes internally to review the files before they commit to transacting those payments. And, and that's an extra layer of security that you get on the banking side. And typically when you're implementing an EFT solution, you'll find that one of the things that takes the most time is going through the testing phase with the bank to ensure that you're complying with the file format that's required. But we take a lot of that effort out of the process by determining up front what the specification says and then building these EFT file types to support that specification. So depending on the bank that you use and the service and the type of payment you're making, we would typically have a compatible file format for you. If we don't, then we ask for a copy of the specification from you and we use that as a way of adding additional payment options within EFT. And now we've got over 650 different file formats that are supported in the system. So whether you're producing payments in Canada for Canadian vendors or US vendors, or international vendors, or same thing in the US, then we can generally support those payments, whether they're domestic or international. So those are, that's really the key to determining how you're going to set up the system. And once you've determined your primary file format, that will have an impact on the information that you use to create your bank information. So when we talk about configuring the bank for EFT, we're using the same bank information that you've already set up within bank services, but now we're saying, what kind of output do we want? Are we creating a file? Are we creating a secure file transfer protocol with a password? So I wanna password protect the information that's being sent out, or am I using an encryption key? with that file. So we've added additional layers of security around the files themselves so that as you generate payments to vendors and you attach a copy of the remittance advice, you can also put a secure key or password on that file attachment. So only the appropriate person at the vendor site who's receiving the email will be able to open that file. And that has obvious application to the payroll direct deposit where you're sending out pay stub information to employees. Only the employee should have the password or key to open up the document. And then we have different file naming uh, procedures where you can match 
the uh, batch number in stage 300 to the EFT file number, or you can use something called file sequence number, so you can test for completeness, and there are other file formats supported. And then where on the network are we storing these files? Again, these are the repositories, whether it's a network file share, Google Docs, Dropbox, or some other uh, repository. And then the file type, which is the main file type that you're using for this particular bank. And if we were going to use the example of JP Morgan, then we would flip down to um, that particular file type. And what you'll see is that depending on the file type that you choose, the screens within Sage 300 of the EFT processing, so if we choose the JP Morgan, that sometimes changes the information that's required with the bank format because depending on the format, sometimes they ask you to specify the currency. So there's a code for the currency, 22 or 32 for Canadian and US dollars respectively. Sometimes there's additional information that they want to store with the file. And then you save that with the bank format. And then the, the other major part of the configuration is the vendors that you want to pay electronically. You can access the information directly from your AP vendor list and accounts payable, but then you would add their bank information, their financial institution ID number and account number, and whether the status is active, which means you can actually send payments to them. And this is where you can also specify an email delivery address, and we can use the EFT vendor email address, as you see here, or we can also pick up the AP vendor delivery method, which could be mail or contact email, depending on which emails you've populated against the AP vendor master file. So as much as possible, we wanna make the, the entire process paperless and it allow you to avoid things like check fraud and identity theft, because it's been proven through statistics that the use of paper-based checks is more vulnerable to identity theft and check fraud. Whereas when you move to an electronic payment format, you're able to safeguard the information, first of all, by keeping the vendor and your bank information private. We secure it through the use of password protection, as well as the security groups within Sage 300. So just like you can set up security groups for your standard Sage 300 modules, we give you the ability to restrict access to the various features within EFT. So you can segregate the duties among your accounting staff to ensure that the same person who creates the AP payment batch isn't the same person who creates the EFT file. And likewise, you may have someone who sets up EFT vendors, but another person who actually approves making them active so they can start receiving electronic payments. So there's a number of different ways that you can secure the information that you configure in EFT by using the security groups within administrative services. And as I've already mentioned, we have the log files where, now you didn't see the screen previously, where we create the unique EFT creation numbers for a test of completeness. And we also create a log as you're adding new vendors and customers in the system. So all of these are ways that you can control access to the data and keeping it private. And we also encrypt the information against your bank, as well as vendor details when you're setting up your vendors or customers. So use the use of security and encryption should ensure in, in conjunction with segregation of duties, secure and valid data within the EFT system and proper approvals, which is where I'll finish off the presentation today. And that is simply to say, now that you're doing electronic payments, you can add approvals into the system by approving the payments through a solution like Tyrox AP check approval, or this extender product comes with workflow capability where you can set up your own workflows and you could have approvals here on the AP payment batch, the AP invoice, or the EFT file creation itself. So using the various tools that are available for workflow approvals, you can also add an extra layer of security by people making conscious approval decisions within Sage 300 around the use of electronic payments. So are there any questions about what we've talked about today?